Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today on this very cold day. Luckily, we didn't have any more snow or ice or anything. It's always hard when we do the final celebration for the fall semester because we can never tell what's going to happen with the weather. So today, um, we're here to celebrate our interns in the Holocaust internship program for fall, the fall uh, 2014 semester. We had a very small group this, this year, much smaller than I've had before, only five students because of scheduling conflicts. We started with nine, but we ended up with five. So it was great, it was very intimate. We got to have a lot of dialogue, a lot of talking, and they worked really hard this semester. This is my oh, third or fourth time leading the internship program, and I'm so grateful for Dr. Arthur Flug, who is the executive director here for about eight years, that he asked me to take over this internship program and lead it. it was, it's been such a great experience because it's forced me to go into so much more research and depth on studying the Holocaust so that I could teach it to these interns. So basically what happens is over the course of 12 weeks, the students meet for about an hour a week, and we go over an intensive history of the Holocaust. We really study it. And the culmination, the end result is the students get assigned a Holocaust survivor that they get to interview one-on-one. -on -one. And it's an amazing experience. I'm so grateful for my time working here at the Holocaust Center because I get to work with all these amazing survivors and hear their stories. And it's all about giving the students that opportunity to actually meet the survivor and hear their story and get to ask the questions. Because it's about going beyond the textbook, right? We can, I could tell you the most interesting stories about the Holocaust and it's amazing. But then when you hear it from the survivor that I experienced it, it's totally different. And I think that we'll see from these students, it's really a life-changing experience in the end. So Dr. Arthur Flug, our director, just retired as of December 31st, which was very upsetting and heartbreaking for all of us, but I'm so grateful that I was able to work with him for a while. And uh, I'm also grateful to uh, the Vice President, Rosemary Zins, for bringing me on here, as well as the President, um, Diane Call, for allowing me to, to work in this position to have this opportunity. So it's really great. It's a great program, and we offer it every semester. And hopefully, we'll be able to just keep it going with funding and support. We do have some uh, local politicians that we'll be stopping in at some point, and we'll let them speak. But for now, we're going to get started right away with our uh, students and survivors. So we're going to start with um, our student, Dania Porto, if you want to come up. Now, she interviewed Holocaust survivor Steve Berger, who was unable to come today because of how cold it was in the weather, and I spoke with him. But so she's going to just speak on her own for a little bit. And uh, let me just tell you about her. She is um, very active in human rights organizations. And she wanted to learn more about the Holocaust because she wanted to learn about empowering local communities. And I was really in excited and inspired by that when I read her cover letter when she applied. She's a biology major here. And she wants to become a doctor. And I think that this really, you'll see, it's the perfect connection working with the survivors, I think, to go into the medical profession. It really changes your outlook and the idea of people dealing with trauma. So I'm going to turn it over to Daniel if you want to just talk a little bit about yourself, however you want to go. All right? OK. Hi, my name is Dania. Um, I don't know what else. OK. Um, <laughs> I've never done something like this before, so I get really, really nervous. Um, my main name is Dania. This is my fourth semester at QCC, Queensboro Community College. Um, my survivor was Steve um, Berger. He was born in Hungary in 1927. Um, he lived with his parents and his younger sister until his, par until his, fa his father was taken away. Um, and then he lived in a small town, in a, in a small rural town, about a, a hundred thousand citizens and within those people um, there were about approximately 10,000 Jews, Jewish people. Um, by 1944 it was already known that um, Germany was losing the war and being that Hungary was an ally, um, Hungary tried to retreat from it and then um, that caught the attention of Nazi Germany and that's when they invaded Hungary. Um, and Mr. at that time, Mr. Berger was 16 years old. He was a pre-engineer student in an excellent Jewish school, which later on, of course, got shut down. Um, after the invasion, they, him and his family lived in 
a ghetto. I didn't get to get the name um, for about three weeks. Um, and Mr. Berger loved books. So before he left, he had his own little library in his house. Um, and most of his books were either by Jewish authors or Western authors, and those were all illegal during that time. Um, and so what he did was that he got all the books and he put them, he wrapped each one of them in wax paper and he put it in a box and then he dug a hole in his backyard and he said, I'll just save them here for when I come back. Um, that was the first thing that I noticed that we had a like, I love books. I've, I think that um, reading is something so special to each person and to each individual art there. Um, what they're trying to express and the connections that you have. Um, and he was saying it like so happily that he was saving his books. Um, so once they went to the, um, once they moved into the ghetto, they were um, put, they were put into rooms where it was two to three families um, per room. And of course, all Jewish people, regardless of their sickness, were taken away from their healthcare facilities and they were all um, put into the same ghetto with, um, without um, enough food or water to keep on, and then, um, sorry, okay. And so once the food started to go away that um, Mr. Berger's family has saved, um, him and two friends used to kind of escape from the ghettos to get, um, used to escape from the ghettos to go and get food, which was illegal. And it happened the last time that one of his n old neighbors saw him and they ca she called the police and they took, and she t um, the police came and got the two um, his two friends and uh, Steven, Steven, sorry, Steve Berger. Um, and they were beat, the, take the food was taken from them and then they were returned to um, the ghetto. Um, once the American and Russian troops began to bomb parts of Egypt, um, Europe, the ghetto was emptied out and the people were taken to a building where they had to put body parts of different soldiers in a morgue. Um, and that happened for a while and then on June 26, 1944, him and his family were sent to a concentration camp. Um, once they were separated, once they were separated by means of age, physical fitness and health, um, he was lucky enough to stay with his mother and his um, younger sister. And when they were separating them by specialized work, um, specialized labor, he said that he was a mechanic. Um, and then he stayed, they stayed working in the concentration camp. Um, and then by April 1945, and the um, bombings began and um, no one had showed up for work. And the SS soldiers disappeared and Mr. Berger was able to convince his mother to leave with them. Um, behind the concentration camp where they worked, there was a sort of, not so close, but a little bit far away, was um, a building, and they were able to hide in the basement until all the bombings and ratings had disappeared. Um, and while, um, and then when Mr. Berger, and then while they were hiding, um, as the soldiers knocked the door and asked if there were any refugees there. Um, he was sitting next to the attendants, they said no. And after a while, Mr. Berger heard something stomp on the door. And then when he, a few moments later, when he got up to open them, the SS soldiers were shot on the floor. And a little bit further from him were Russian soldiers that were already um, there and they, that's when they were liberated. Um, Mr. Berger came here, his parents came here first. He stayed in Italy and in, um, and in France for a while. And then he came here in 1949. He, they were able to reunite with his father, although they didn't have any connection to him. They, him, his mother and his sister walked by foot from where they were back to Hungary. And they were able to meet up his father. His parents came here and then he came here in 1949 to take care of them. Um, unfortunately, 26 of Mr. Berger's mother's side of family members were killed in Auschwitz. Um, now, there hasn't been a day in, in this museum that I haven't learned something new. <laughs> so, I learned that with 
Mr. Berger that in fact with Mr. Berger the last day of the um, of the internship, which was supposed to be like when I interviewed him, I guess, um, I learned that the na the um, handicapped German children were the first ones to be killed by the Nazi regime um, in a program known as the Euthanasian Program. At san sanatoriums injected, and they were injected with poison at first, and then that's when they delivered the guy um, gas chambers and they also put in the ad, um, they also killed adults that were handicapped as well. Um, throughout, throughout, the whole throughout the whole interview, I was trying um, my hardest not to cry while Mr. Berger was telling me his stories. Um, and I think that one of the nicest things of the interview was that we were talking, I was recording him thankfully. So I was able to just look at him and he, I was able to read all of his expressions in the way that he was telling me the stories and I kind of, it kind of played like a little script in my head. Um, I believe that all survivors are strong and admirable and it's amazing that in fact we can call them survivors after all of these horrible events that have taken place. But the ones that <coughs> retell their stories for future generations contribute so much <laughs> into creating a better world. <laughs> and creating awareness. Um, I knew that in this internship overall was going to be very changing for me because <coughs> I believe in a better world. Um, well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I never imagined that it would touch me like it has touched me now. Um, for the past few months, I was reconsidering what uh, um, the effort and the energy and all of the overtime work that I was putting into the wonderful nonprofits that I volunteer with. Um, and I have these two very separate um, support systems in my life. One are very conservative and like very, um, they don't believe in a lot of social movements or people getting together and creating change. And the other ones are the ones that I work with which are more liberal. Um, and the ones that were on the conservative side were telling Melissa, you need to stop, my second middle name is Melissa. Um, Melissa, stop wasting your time like doing these type of activities because nothing is gonna change, the system is not gonna change and you need to focus on your future and your career and your work. And I was starting to agree, because to be honest, I didn't see a lot of things changing that I wanted to change. Um, but once I met Steve Berger, all my hopes, passions, and reasons to keep on came back to me. I was able to remember why it was so important to fight, I guess, against hate crimes and um, um, issues that Brought, that separated us and that divided us instead of just being one human race. Um, you can kind of say he brought me back to my grounds and I will be in forever in gratitude with him because, and for this internship, for waking me up and for making me realize that what I was doing was the right thing and that it doesn't matter how long it takes or the time like it doesn't matter as long as we keep on fighting so things like this never happen again um and i truly believe that at least from my personal view my world is a better place because of survivors like you i have never been introduced to resilience like i was shown here um and thank you so much dr luke and marissa and mr steve berger for helping me take part of this project. We're going to interject right now. I'd like to ask uh, New York City Council Member Mark Weprin to come up and say a few words, because I know how busy their schedules are in case he needs to escape. So thank you so much. He's been such a big supporter of the Holocaust Center and all of the work that we do, and especially with the, uh, the Holocaust internship. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I, mean, I don't want to interrupt, because I know the reason we're here is to hear from the interns, and that was, you did terrific. And, and really, you know, you showed why they do this program, because it does change people's lives, change people's perspectives. 
And the Holocaust Resource Center is really about educating people about the horrors of the Holocaust, but as you can look around this room, not just talking about the Holocaust during World War II, but other atrocities throughout our lifetimes and what continues to go on today. So what you talk about the different influences in your lives. Uh, I'm the New York City Council. We got those conservatives and the liberals, and, uh, and uh, they're always fighting with each other. But there's no question in my mind that the best way to effectuate change is to speak out, is to get involved with people, because it's the silent, the si silence is the killer of change. And, and the Holocaust Resource Center is, is all about educating and talking about it, talking about the horrors, because the only way to stop it from happening again is for people to be educated, so maybe we can stop it in the future. Uh, and not just talking about Jews or other people, but any of these discriminations that are going on throughout the world at any time. So I really am, am proud of that. I, ha I have certificates for all the interns. I don't know if you want me to give them now, yeah, or? Yeah, let's have all the interns just come up, because we'll come do up? a big photo. If you don't mind. Yesterday. So we have Anika and Anita. <laughs> Anika is very interested in history, and she actually, I was looking through all their original application paperwork, and I, I forgot that Anika had actually taken a trip here to the Holocaust Resource Center when she was in middle school. So that's where she first learned about the center. And then uh, she's here, she's getting a liberal arts major. She wants to get her bachelor's in either journalism or political science, I don't know if that changed through the course this semester, but she's thinking about eventually going into law. So, so we, uh, she was assigned to interview Anita Weisberg, so I will pass it along. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Anika, and I got to interview Anita Weisberg. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. Um, Anita was born in Vienna, Austria, and had a very happy upbringing. Um, but then in March 1938, uh, Hitler invaded Austria. Um, and she stated about this that the childhood that she knew um, had basically just disappeared. Um, she went from living like a very comfortable life to no longer being allowed to go to school or university or like parks or other public places and um, the laws that Hitler had instilled even like took tolls on her friendship um, and one of her best friends wouldn't talk to her because she was scared because um, Anita was Jewish. And uh, during the Kristallnacht, um, Anita witnessed her father being arrested. And her brother, in turn, decided to go to France illegally. Um, and he later uh, ended up living in Africa. Um, and then she decided to go to England after because uh, for those who were trying to flee Austria after the Kristallnacht, um, visas were a huge issue. Um, but England allowed uh, an unspecified number of children to uh, flee there, and she um, she vividly recalled the uh, her time on the Kinder transport, where um, which took her from Austria to England. Uh, and she didn't even know where England was on a map at that time, but her mother wanted um, uh, her mother wanted what was best for her, basically. Um, and to this day, she remembers her mother seeing her off, and she stated that she believes that her mother gave birth to her twice, when she was born and when she had the strength and foresight to send her off on the kinder transport. Um, and she went to England with nothing but a small suitcase and was taken un under the wing of a missionary who wanted to save both her life and her soul. Um, yeah, she had um, to adjust to a completely unfamiliar country. Um, and I think that must have been terrifying because I don't know if I could have done that. Um, and. Thankfully, a few uh, years later, she was reunited with her family, who um, who all survived the Holocaust, or at least like her immediate family. Um, and her sister was also in England and was um, like she was like a maid and stuff like that, just 
to, she was working jobs basically that um, people in England needed just to get her by. And uh, when she was re reunited with her brother, she, he barely recognized her. Um, and like I know you said, like he said that, like, oh, you're the little one. Um, <laughs> Um, and eventually she received a letter in the mail, uh, and she was afraid to open it even because she didn't know what it would say. Um, she just knew that it was regarding her parents, but, it, uh, thankfully it said that they were alive, and, um, she later found out about the harsh treatments that they, um, had to endure, like beatings, and I know she said that her mother was in, um, was sent to like a concentration camp and then she saw a ditch and she had the choice of either uh, hiding in the ditch or just being shot I believe and um, she decided to hide instead and thankfully she made it um, and I think that the the reason for their separation was horrible but um, I think the fact that her entire immediate family uh, survived it was bittersweet um, and now she says that if she could give young people advice, it would be to be tolerant to other people, respect everybody's religion and everybody's gender. Um, and she said, we're all human beings and we all deserve to live in peace. Um, and yeah, so now she, uh, she tries to make the best out of her experiences and she volunteers, um, and has been volunteering for about 10 years. Um, and I think that's a lot more positive and a lot healthier than holding any hostility towards her experiences. Um, and yeah, I just think it made her a stronger person. I don't think I could have endured being separated by my family for something as hateful as that. And yeah. That's it. You'd be surprised what you can do if you have to. Yeah. But she asked me a question, what message? should she have from the experience. And I told her that we are telling the story of the Holocaust to show what hate can lead to, and not to be bystanders, to be upstanders when something happens, to speak up. And teaching the young people, the new generation, our hope is that it should never happen again. Absolutely. Thank you. Anika, do you want to say anything about how you felt about the experience of doing the internship and getting to interview a survivor? Um, I'm extremely grateful that I had this opportunity. Um, I learned a lot in this internship, actually, because we got a deeper insight to the Holocaust. And I learned about it very vaguely in classes in high school and middle school and even now in college. But um, you kind of see the like when you're researching it so much, you kind of see what it's like for them in their shoes, I guess. Um, and yeah, I am just very grateful for this experience. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So Marvin uh, applied to this internship because much like most students that apply, he wanted to to learn more about the Holocaust, but his cover letter was really interesting because he was talking about how he wanted to gain a better understanding of people's behaviors after undergoing trauma. And I thought that was so eloquent and interesting that that was the motive and direction that he was taking. So he's a liberal arts, math and science major. I'm not exactly sure what your plan is career-wise. I don't know if we ever talked about it, so maybe you'll tell us. And he interviewed Mordecai Miller. This is the first time we've actually had Mordecai Miller be involved in the internship program. So I'm very excited because I don't really know his story, so I'm gonna be learning it along with everyone and, and Marvin as well. So thank you so much for coming. He traveled pretty far. What town was it? East Northport <laughs> in this weather. So we really appreciate that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So um, I'm going to pass it all on to, to Marvin will speak, and then if you want to say a few words, okay? Um, nice and loud, too, so everyone can hear. Okay, my name is Marvin Pinnock. I interviewed Mordecai Miller. He was born in 1931 in Por Poland. Uh, okay. With my major, I want to do, I really have a passion for psychology. That's why I wanted to study traumas. 
uh, doing the internship would help me, you know, like understand people's behavior when dealing with them. Okay. With his story, he started off telling me about his parents owning a grocery store, uh, which I believe personally would, I thought that that would make him, made them well off in a sense, in the fact that he described to me the economy at the time that Jews could not own land and people within the town, they would harvest and then Jews would own businesses and that's how they made a living. He lived with his parents and his brother, uh, and his story. He told us all about how they went through a lot of deter a, a lot of struggles, having to go against hunger, all of that. And I think they made it through through determination and being really, really lucky at some points. Uh, at the age of eight, this is when you had. They proclaimed that Jews could not go to school anymore and they were to be put to live in ghettos now. Um, within the ghettos they had to go through contribution days where they had to pay rents, pay money just for food. Uh, they had to buy food through a barter system, he said. Uh, and, and if they ever left the ghetto they would face death. Um, he told stories about how his mother having to go out, go outside the ghetto to get food. Um, I think his, his entire family went there and he went, his mother was I think chosen because the soldiers were a little bit more kinder to females at the time. So with men they probably end up dying and the females in Moreland like you just get beat up so in his case his mother went out once and she came when she got the food she got beat up and they took care of her a second incident she went out um, and bartered with someone using a garment getting back 50 pounds of potatoes on her way back a couple of Polish thugs tried to take it from her and she ran and she fell and hurt her knee um, at the time they, she, it swelled up really badly and they couldn't, she couldn't walk or anything um, within the ghetto there wasn't um, a proper doctor so they went to the doctor spoke to the doctor and the doctor told them he couldn't do anything about the knee and that she needed a surgeon um, at the time there was no surgeon within the ghetto so the only thing they could do his father asked the doctor if there was any surgeon nearby he said yes they would have to go outside the ghetto to, to speak to a Russian a Russian refugee a refugee <laughs> a ref, a Russian refugee who was a surgeon um, his father went out of course doing this for his wife went out spoke to the refugee. The refugee at the time didn't want to do it because he didn't want to risk his own life for somebody he didn't exactly know. But he... To a Jew in the ghetto. Yeah. So he had an oath. He remembered an oath he made with becoming a doctor that it's not about his personal health, it's about the person's. So he changed his mind, went back, and he did the surgery. The surgery came in time because right afterwards the ghetto became li um, liquidated and the family was able to leave and go into hiding afterwards. Between 1942 and 1944, they had to keep changing where they lived. Um, each time they'd be somewhere, someone would expose their hiding place. I remember once he was saying he lived in a shed. He lived in a shed um, with his family. Uh, also, he had to. It, the money ran out, so they had to start stealing food. So they li they lived on a farm. There, there was a farm nearby, and they would have to steal some potatoes from the farm. But he didn't make it 
they didn't make it so apparent to the farmer because if they did, uh, the farmer would call the Germans and hurt them. So they said they had that little ploy where they'll take some food but make sure that the farmer didn't know. Uh, after a while, that place also got exposed and they left. Uh, they started living in the forest. Within the forest, uh, a German soldier who was out there hunting, he saw them and thought they were just a peasant family. So he offered them a job to come and live with them, um, to come and work in the kitchen with them. Uh, they accepted the job only because, one, it would be suspicious if they didn't take it, and two, they needed the food. So while working there, they worked for a while. Everything was good. They were treated well. They were fed, all this. Um, then, uh, I think after three months, the, the group, they found out that the group was the SS Viking Division, 5th Company, the Panzer Grenaders. Uh, this group left and went to Hungary to fight in the war. Uh, they left a letter of recommendation for the next unit that was coming in. Uh, they stayed, the family stayed and worked with the next unit. Uh, on January 16, 1945, a local woman within the town um, suspect, suspected that the family was Jewish and she reported to the German soldier that um, that the family was Jewish and he said he would take care of it by going there to deal with them with his pistol. Uh, the next day, January 17, they were liberated by the Russians. <laughs> so this is what I meant by them being extremely lucky. Um, this happened when Mordecai was 14. Uh, in 1948, Mordecai and his family moved to Israel where Mordecai served in the army for six years. Uh, two years after leaving the, the army, Mordecai found himself in the United States. Uh, within the United States, he lived first in Brooklyn, where, he's found, where he found his wife. And then he moved to Long Island, where he got four children and six grandchildren. Uh, one of the questions was, what was the message that you would try to pass on to, to your audience? His message was, there should be no bullying, no hate, as hate is a disease that destroys us as a people. Living by good codes and fellowship is what we should strive for. I believe in what he has said. I mean, as a people, and even as a psychologist, you normally fi try to find out what's wrong with people and then try to find ways to help them cooperate with others in fellowship. I believe talking to him has been a great opportunity, seeing that somebody who can go through that trauma can still be very normal. It's strong enough to be able to talk about his story without any problems go through everything and as a f for me really one thing that really stood out to me was like his whole family still stick together and they went through it all together because for me family is very important I, family comes first that's my first priority and no having somebody who has gone through so much with their family and still coming out I believe that has been really good. So, send it. <laughs> good job. Good job. Uh, Mordecai, do you want to say a few words or about the experience of, of being interviewed? He got it correct. He got everything. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote it down, everything right. There's more stories to it. And it's not so easy. You play a game, you know, but you come home, it does damage to us, especially at night. We didn't speak about the Holocaust for 40 years. 
Nobody spoke about it between us or friends, nobody. Till it started with denial. There's nothing happened, that's all a lie, it's all this bigotry. Then it was like an awakening to us. The same thing, American GIs, they saw atrocities in Europe with the concentration camps. They never talked. Recently, they started to speak. Same thing. It wasn't easy. Great. Well, we're so grateful that all of our survivors are willing to share their stories. We know it's not easy, but it's so important. So, all right. Thank you guys so much. That's wonderful. Frizana first learned about the Holocaust Center here when she attended an event that we were holding uh, for the Queensboro Student Muslim Association. So we had an event here and that's where she first came into the center. And this led to her becoming an intern in one of our other internships, because we have three. We have the Holocaust, we have one on uh, the Asian Social Justice um, project which talks about what was happening in Asia during World War II and we have an internship on hate crimes and that was the internship that she did so she's a pro she's done our internships before right uh, for her like most students she wanted to learn more about the Holocaust but she really wanted to meet a survivor and get the opportunity to interview a survivor and I think that more and more as more students find out about the internship program for people it's that aspect. They want to learn the history, but they want that opportunity that we all know is so precious to actually talk to a, to a survivor. So um, her, her major is health sciences here, okay? And so I'll pass it along, um, nice and loud. <laughs> Hello, my name is Farzana Siddiqui. Um, I'm a health science major here in QCC. This is actually my second internship here at the Kaufenberg Holocaust Center. Um, Thank you. I had the pleasure of interviewing Ms. Katz. Thank you, Ms. Professor Berman, for having me and ultimately admitting me into this internship. Um, I, I always wanted to meet a survivor. It was like, whenever I would hear about the Holocaust, I was, it's always just that one side that I would see, and I never, we never got that opportunity to hear an actual survivor story. So I've always wanted to meet one me a survivor, and I found this opportunity and I took it. I, I ran with it. Miss um, Katz was born in Bouchash, Poland, is yeah. uh, she is. She was actually a twin. Uh, her older brother was unfortunately killed during the invasion of Hitler. Uh, she has she three brothers and one sister. And uh, in July 5th, 1941, Hitler invaded her town and he started killing right away. It was, it was more along the, the rushed killing during that time. They didn't slow down. Uh, they first destroyed synagogues and holy books and they killed 100 Jews in the first week. And um, they had a, um, an announcement that all males from 18 to 60 had to go to the police station before 6 o'clock. And all of the men were professionals. It had to be educated males. And her brother was one of those males. And he was sent to the police station, and he never came back. Ms. Katz is from a fairly large family. And I also come from a very large family. I'm the youngest out of 10 children. And <laughs> I know it's a large number. So I felt really close to her in the sense that she comes from such a large family. And she's the only remaining survivor. So it hurt close to home because how would I feel if the whole family <laughs> was taken away from me? And it's, it was really compelling when I was listening to her. Um, in 1942, the Germans sped up the genocides, and they had many raids and actions. Raids, um, they sent Jews to the, um, they killed many Jews during that time during actions. Um, actions were well-organized murder attacks and the Gestapo and the soldiers hunted down Jews, and there was three actions during that time. The third action was the largest. Over 4,000 Jews were murdered. Um, in 1942, they liquidated the ghetto and survivors spread from the city. Um, her family, which was only her father, her mother died before the war, 
So it was just her father, her two brothers, because her, her twin was murdered, and her old and her sister. They first, they ran to a, um, their farm. They had a farm at the time, and they hid in chicken coops and and once they hid in a corn stack for two days and it's just, it's just the idea of having to hide in haystacks to survive is it's terrible because your whole family you're like you're on the run and just the fear of living day to day knowing that tomorrow might never may never come is just it's not a not a happy sight. It's not a good feeling. And um, in 1943, uh, they, they hid in the chicken coop and then in the shed. And after that, in a small cottage where um, the owner, I believe, he, the, it was a male and a woman, right? Him and his yeah. wife. The, the owner, he was very kind. He let them stay, but his wife is the one who kicked them out. She wasn't very, take kindly. She didn't take kindly to Jews. And then in 1943, they hid in also in grain fields. I remember when I was interviewing her, um, she told me about how when the, when their farm was the Gestapo came through and they cleared it out, they ran and hid. And when they came, they also they made a circle about and they came right back to their farmhouse because they after after the Nazi soldiers came through, they went back and they thought they were safe, but the soldiers returned and their father pushed them out of a window to save them and he told them to run and she was hit in the back of the head with a gun and she fell and she thought she at that moment she was going to die but um, the soldier was started chasing after her brothers and in that sense she survived from that one from that moment and when she was telling me this I started crying and I remember Miss Professor Berman told me I'm very stoic towards this whole uh, when I through all the lessons we were going through, I was I was, didn't show that much emotion, but I actually broke down for Miss Katz because the idea of witnessing your family's death is just it's difficult to th to think that I'm oh, sorry <laughs> to see them eliminated in front of you, and you can't you have you're completely powerless. The idea of being powerless is it's horrible to, to think that you can't do anything to save them. It must be a horrible feeling, and I wouldn't, I can't Im imagine how it would feel. I put myself in her position every single time she was telling me of her experience. And I, I try to imagine what it would be like, and it's really hard. I couldn't, I couldn't take it because just the idea of losing family members sends shivers down my spine. I couldn't handle it. So when, when Professor Berman mentioned that I was pretty stoic throughout the internship, I started thinking about that. I was like, was I really stoic? And I realized that looking at pictures on the slide is far different than actually hearing a first eyewitness story. So the emotion, her facial expression, the, the attention to detail when she's telling me about it, it sends, it moves a person, it sends emotion, it evokes different feelings rather than looking at slides and facts and statistics. It's, it's different. Um, I, uh, I remember she was telling me when she, after her family was, her brothers and her sister and her father were, were murdered, she was laying there on the ground motionless and she saw three youngsters coming towards her. She didn't know who they were, so she automatically thought, oh no, I'm in danger again. So thinking that the, it's not the calm before the storm, it's, it's, it's horrifying to think of being in that position where you, you think you're facing death, but really she didn't know who they were. It turns out they were um, three Polish youngsters. They were, they rescued her. They, they, they were Christian boys, they were Christian, right? And they were guarding their area, their land from the Ukrainians because the Ukrainians and the Polish were having, they were clashing. And they recognized her because they knew her father and they saved her and they helped her bury her family. And she said that she is forever grateful for them because they gave a Christian prayer 
when they were burying her family and because a human's a human, everyone deserves a proper burial and that spoke to me on a different level because no matter what, a person deserves a proper burial. You never desecrate the dead. You don't walk on grave graveyards. You respect them. And that's what he did. And when she told me that she's forever grateful, I felt that sense of gratitude as well. After she um, buried her family, she went back to the city to recuperate. But a week later, Hitler reoccupied the city. And she hid in the attic of a house, an abandoned house, she found it, and she hid it. Eventually, that house was occupied by the Nazi soldiers. So she's living in an attic directly above the enemy. And that was something you read in the storybook, but here it is in real life. And I was so awestruck by that. Um, there was a false door on the attic, and that's how she got in. And she sat there in that small, cramped area for four months with nothing but a piece of bread. Again, I put myself in her position, and I thought, at that time she was like 19, and I was thinking, when I was 19, would I have been able to survive in, with nothing, with no one, all alone in an attic? And I don't know if I could. I Honestly, I'm still, that question has, I don't wanna say haunted me, but it's been affecting me since the interview. Like, what would I have done? Would I have been reacted the same way she has? Would, would I have been strong enough like she has? I remember um, <clears throat> my sister told me that um, that I'm strong, but I gave up too easy. So if I was in such a situation, would I give up? Would I have given up? And I honestly, I don't know if I would or if I would have survived or not. Um, she took risks while she was in that attic for four months, she was, she told me about how she was suffering from hunger and starvation and because the dehydra dehydration was so severe, she could feel her esophagus tearing because there was no water. So she took the risk of going downstairs into the house and finding a pail of water, but she was smart about it. She recognized that there was a sick soldier down when she was in the attic and he kept coughing but so she knew that he never moved from that spot, so he was bedridden. So she waited till all the Nazi soldiers that were in the house would leave because they would do rounds, and they would leave. So she waited till they left, and then she, would, she went down, she found a pail of water, she drank almost all of it, <laughs> and then she went back up to the attic. And um, she had to transfer the water from the pail because it was too big to fit into the attic. She had to transfer it, and she did. And she lasted for the rest of the four months there until the Russian soldiers liberated them in July 22nd, 1944. This, when she was telling me that section of her story, it's amazing how, I, like, I thought it was so amazing because human resilience and perseverance got her through it. And you can't, like, it's, I remember it was, I was just take so awestruck by that. Um, you were there. You saw it all. You tell it like you saw it. You were there. <laughs> yeah, I imagined the entire. I'm a visual learner. I'm like, I also paint and draw, so I imagined how it would be and how it would look. And she's she was a young girl, so it was the idea of her being in that area for such a long time. She was in a cramped space, so I can only imagine the toll toll it took on her body. Um, her stay in the attic spoke to me on a different level. It showed me the extent of human resilience and how even through adversity, uh, even though adversity may come in one's survival, the human spirit is much stronger and it can overcome it. Um, so just the idea of her being in that attic and surviving and eventually escaping is an um, unimaginable feat and I'm so taken back by it and it's inspi inspiring because it just made me realize that some people have it much worse than I do and it can made me come to appreciate my family members all the more. I'm grateful that I still have my nine siblings and my two parents whereas there are other people out there that can't have the, their family members. So doing this interview and 
going through this internship just opened my mind and even further and helped me appreciate everything much more. And I'm so grateful that I was able to interview her and to take part in this internship. Uh, Ethel, do you want to say anything? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. You were there with me. <laughs> she uh, absorbed the story and I am very glad she knows it through and through. She felt the tragedy, the greatest tra tragedy of uh, the world. And I, she will tell the world because it's important to me. I remember in a certain situation, a Gestapo was in front of the house and miracle happened, he was called away. And my father was praying, and then he said, who will tell the world what we are suffering? Here is the person. <laughs> I have confidence. She will tell the world, and the world will know of the greatest crime in the human history. So that's important, and I thank you very much. It's all we have to to tell the world about the crime, to learn from it. It shouldn't happen anymore. We must to eliminate the hatred. All we have to do to live in harmony, we have to respect our neighbor. We have to respect his nationality, his religion, his culture, his language. Then we could live in peace together next door and just we live in harmony. That's all what we have to do. I am glad this young generation will tell the world what, what happened, what it means, the Holocaust, and we have to work for a better world. It should never happen again. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you guys so much. Again, Zena applied to the internship program to learn more about the Holocaust, which is like everyone wanted to do. And she's a nursing major, and she wants to become a registered nurse eventually. But she's also interested in being an elementary school teacher. So she's going to win out. <laughs> yes, exactly. Which one? So she likes working with... Uh, the elderly and with small children, which I think actually makes a lot of sense. So we'll see what path ends up happening for her. Um, so I'll pass it along to Zena. <laughs> Hi, my name is Zena Williams, and I had the opportunity to begin this internship through a friend of mine who, um, she said, there's an internship that's going on with the Holocaust, and she said, would you like, would you be interested in joining? So I said, sure, you know, and I decided to apply, and I got in, <laughs> thanks to Miss Berman. And when I went to interview, when I first met Miss Silka, she, the first question she asked me, she said, um, why, why do the Holocaust? Why did you register to, you know, apply to, you know, with the Holocaust? And I said to her, growing up, it was never taught to me in school. You know, the school that I went to never mentioned anything about the Holocaust to us, and I only heard about the Holocaust, but I never learned anything about it. And this opportunity was the greatest opportunity for me to learn more about the Holocaust. So she was like, tell your friend I said thank you <laughs> for making you a part of the internship, and I was grateful. So, Ms. Ellen Zaka, um, she was born in Germany, and li but lived in Berlin with her parents. And she was the eldest of her parents. She was 10 years old, and she had a brother who was five. <laughs> Ellen was never a part of any of the camps back in Germany, so she was mostly grateful for that. Um, her dad, she, she told me her dad was a shoe salesman who was a shoe salesman for a factory and her mom was a homemaker. While she attended school and 
pretty much other than her family lived in the suburbs and had a pretty simple life up until 1933 when Hitler came in and started making laws over she said over 10,000 children were sent to England that year and most of them came from Germany Ellen's parents tried to obtain visas for her for themselves and Ellen and her brother however her parents did not get the visas but Ellen and her brother did. So they were able to leave Germany before any war crimes, you know, started back in Germany. Um, they were accepted and to the kinder transport. <laughs> they left on the kinder transport. However, Ellen and her brother did not leave together. They were separated when they left on the kinder transport. Um, on July 25th, 1939, the war broke out, and on September 3rd, 1939, Silke went to Holland by, when she went to Holland by boat to England. Um, her brother, you know, went to, he ended up in a home. Private family. Yeah, in a home with a family, and Ellen lived in south of England with a, she ended up with a lady who was a retired nurse. So she ran a center, of, a rehabilitation center of 10 women um, in their 60s. So Ellen lived with her during those years. And she lived there for up to seven years, up until 1946. During that year, Circus Aunt, who lived here in New York, um, got her a visa to come to Boston, Massachusetts. Ellen went to college. She studied to become a librarian at the Queen's Library. <laughs> she worked there for over 33 years, which is a very, very long time. <laughs> yeah. So after that, she got married. She met her husband. <laughs> and they have three kids, one boy and two girls, of whom now they have four grandchildren. She has been married for over 62 years. I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked. I was like, 62 years? That's really, really long. <laughs> Very fortunate. Very fortunate. Yeah. Miss <laughs> um, Ellen, um, back in Germany, they lived comfortably. And uh, Ellen's brother, at the age of five, um, never got to see a sister, but she kept in contact with her brother and her mother, who wrote letters back and forth, back and forth to each other. However, her brother, you know, being separated from your sister and your parents, you know, living in this home and not being able to see them again, it affected him the most in a way that he committed suicide at age of 72 years old. And she doesn't really talk about it much. You know, it's memories of her brother, but at the same time, it's, you know, it's heartbreaking for her and her family. So after that, she never mentions anything about it. You know, even though her family knows about him, she doesn't say anything. She just has those memories and the letters and what they share together. So my experience with the Holocaust is, <laughs> you know, life changing to see what's been going on around the world for over 70 years, you know. And I've learned that there are a lot of people out there that has went through so much that went through so much, you know, and it's it opens your eyes it opens everything that it changes you it changes you really 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 drastically and i've learned from helen that you know there are many things in this world to be grateful for be grateful that you have family be grateful that you never had to experience what we went through back when she was growing up um, and I want to be able to tell people her story, 
you know, you know, say I've met I've met a survivor of the Holocaust for the first time in my life. And I want to share that story with others. I want to tell them that there are other people, no matter how much you complain about your life today, you know, there are other people that's been through more than you have. So be grateful, be thankful that you have life and you have your family. It's not easy being separated from your family and not seeing them again, you know. So be happy, be grateful. <laughs> and you know, it can change, it can either make you or change you, break you or change you. That's it. <laughs> Ellen, do you want to say anything? Or? Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, <laughs> now, Zena, we clicked. There was, a, I can't think of the right word, but there was, you know, it, it just clicked. She, she understood. And it she asked wonderful questions, and uh, I was happy to answer them, but as she said, and as the gentleman said, we haven't talked about it much in the past. Um, two things I want to say. Um, for the parents that let their children go on the kinder transport, and there were almost 10,000 of us, uh, we were youngsters. I don't think we really understood what was happening. Uh, it was almost like we're going on a big vacation, like going to summer camp. Uh, the parents played down the separation, and I think the bravery was uh, shown by the parents by letting their children go, and the parents deep down knew that many of us would never be reunited, as we were not. So that's number one. And in answer to the young man who's studying the result of trauma, uh, my brother's story, and he was only five years old when he had to leave his parents. And it had such a, an effect on him that he had difficulty in relating to people and coping with life. And he had a lifelong hatred deep down of anything German. And he did sublimate that by being very active in Jewish causes. And he, was, he went to Israel on a kibbutz. He was happy there. But unfortunately, life was not good to him. And he repeatedly felt rejected because my family that brought me over to America offered to bring him over. And the family that took him in, who were childless, and they gave him a good home, wouldn't let him go. They said they had adopted him, but in truth they had never legally adopted him. So again he felt rejected. He had some family in the U.S. he couldn't join it. And as I said, he had difficulty relating to people. He was an entrepreneur but had no financial uh, skills. And when his financial situation came to too much, he took his life. And we consider him a victim of Hitler, even though he survived. Thank you for listening. All right, I want to thank everyone so much for coming today. I want to thank the students. It's hard going through the whole semester. Sometimes you don't know if, if the students got it, you know, if, you, if they connected to it. You know, they come to the class, you know, sometimes we would have very intense discussions, sometimes there would be emotions, and, but you never really know. And it's so clear from watching all these final presentations just how deeply it affected everyone and that it really was an experience for them. So, so that makes me very happy and very, very grateful too. Um, we're so lucky right now living in this time right now, that we get to interact and learn from survivors. We are probably the last generation that will be able to do so. So we have to take that opportunity and we're gonna keep this internship going as long as that we can and then 
when that day comes, when there are no more survivors, we're going to talk to the children of survivors. We're going to, we're going to keep going because we got to keep telling the story. And then maybe one day we'll have these students that interviewed survivors come and be interviewed by future <laughs> students, right? So thank you, everyone. Happy New Year. And uh, we'll see you next semester. <laughs> okay, thank you.